Pope Francis has flown to the United Arab Emirates, becoming the first pontiff to visit the Arabian Peninsula. Before boarding his flight to Abu Dhabi, the Pope issued his strongest condemnation yet of the war in Yemen, where the UAE plays a leading military role. It's not clear whether Pope Francis will raise the subject during his visit. I appeal to all sides involved and to the international community to urgently press for respect of the agreements that have been reached, guarantee the distribution of food and work for the good of the population. I invite everybody to pray strongly for our brothers in Yemen. The Pope will spend less than 48 hours in the UAE, where he will meet Muslim leaders in an effort to promote interfaith dialogue. He's described the visit as an opportunity to write a new page in the history of relations between religions. He'll also celebrate an outdoor mass for some 120,000 Catholics. About two million expat Catholics live in the Arabian Peninsula, many of them migrant workers. Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade Peter Seattle called the Freedom House's newest statements on democratic rights nonsense. The American nonprofit organization stated in its 2015 report that in Hungary the quality of democratic governance has dropped. Peter Seattle also called it nonsense that the organization wants to downgrade Hungary based on its stance in the migrant crisis. We were elected by the Hungarian people. It is our task and duty to tend to the Hungarian people's interest and security as well as we can. Our motivation is not to fight for the praise of people sitting in offices thousands of kilometers away. For more than a week, the island nation of Haiti has been rocked by street violence as protesters, angry over soaring inflation and government corruption, have demanded the ouster of President Jovenel Moise. Demonstrators have been blocking roads, stoning emergency vehicles and destroying businesses. The death toll from last week's attack by armed men in northwestern Nigeria has risen to more than 130, the governor of Kaduna State announced, citing ethnic motive. It was initially reported that 66 people had been killed following the attack on eight villages in Kajuru district. And now what we are hearing, the last report we got, is that over 130 people were killed, not even 66. Last week, the governor declared that the victims of the armed attack were Fulani people. Kaduna State Police Chief Ahmed Abdurrahman has announced the arrest of 11 people in connection with the attack. There is no indication that the attack was related to Nigeria's delayed election. Kaduna State has experienced attacks by armed groups where cattle thieves or extremist religious groups clash. As news of the signing of the agreement reached Bitola, protesters here started gearing up. They staged a ritual funeral procession through the city center to show their sadness for the new name of the small Balkan nation, the Republic of North Macedonia. Behind them, the leader of Macedonia's largest opposition party, the Vemero de Pomene, Christian Mitskoski, followed by thousands of supporters. All of them to say they will not accept the deal and that they don't want the current name of the country to change. This is an emotional time for many. Each read from a similar script no longer willing to swallow party policy on Brexit, <laughs> applauded by those who've just left Labour. When we have a Prime Minister bullied into submission by the ERG and is now dragging the country and Parliament, kicking and screaming to the edge of a no-deal abyss, I'm done. The hardline anti-EU awkward squad that have destroyed every leader for the last 40 years are now running the Conservative Party from top to tow. The party that was once the most trusted on the economy and on business is now marching us towards the cliff edge of a no-deal Brexit. A month after declaring himself the president, Juan Guaido attempts to fulfill his first promise of bringing humanitarian aid into Venezuela with the help of his allies like the United States and neighboring Colombia. Our call is peaceful but firm for the advisement of humanitarian aid to Venezuela. 
The call on the armed forces is very clear. Welcome to the right side of history. Welcome to those soldiers who today sided with the Constitution. Opposition activists also defied President Nicolas Maduro, who sent the military to country's border to stop aid being delivered. But the opposition's strategy to try and convince security forces to back them had limited success. A video released by Guaido appears to show soldiers crossing the border into Colombia, recognizing him as president. But many stayed in their posts, fending off the repeated attempts of activists trying to cross the border from Colombia. Scores were injured by tear gas canisters and rubber bullets. One aid truck that did manage to cross was soon set on fire. Clashes at the border with Brazil were even more violent with pro-government militia firing live rounds, claiming lives of at least four people. President Nicolás Maduro blamed the United States for the crisis in his country and announced his decision to break diplomatic ties with Colombia. Fierce battles continue tonight as U.S.-backed forces move into the last ISIS stronghold in eastern Syria. Civilians are pouring out. Charlie Daggett met some of them. They're the latest surge in an overwhelming flood of civilians. Human shields trapped inside the last remaining ISIS village and the single biggest obstacle slowing down the U.S.-led offensive. 500 more today alone who say they escaped in the early hours of this morning defying ISIS death threats. So ISIS tried to make you stay? Uh, yes, they wouldn't let us go, Hala Mohammed, a mother of five, told us. We had to risk our lives to get here. Every day they've been streaming out of the village many more than troops here had anticipated. And what's striking is the number of children we're finding. Children who have only ever known life under ISIS. If there is a positive note about the mass exodus, it's that the people here say there are now very few civilians left inside, just five to 600 ISIS fighters facing inevitable defeat. For Hala, whose husband has already been killed in an airstrike, there's no love lost. What does it mean to you to see the end of ISIS? What is she? They mean nothing to me, she said, they're trash. With fewer civilians left, the U.S.-led defeat of the last ISIS holdouts in Syria may be imminent. And each person, every child who escapes that village, is one less civilian to worry about inside it. Of the Indian Air Force strike this morning, it all began at 3.30 a.m. this morning. It was a large package of aircraft, the details of which we can now share with you. It wasn't just the 12 Mirage 2000 Indian Air Force fighters, though they did play the most prominent role. There was a Netra indigenous airborne early warning aircraft. There were Falcon airborne early warning aircraft. We procured these from Israel a few years back. There were four Sukhoi 30 fighters which deployed from the Halwara Air Base to give top cover for these Mirage 2000s as they went into the attack. And there were Illusion 78 air-to-air -air refueling tankers as well when the strike package went in and came out. What was the target? It was a massive jaish e Mohammed uh, training camp in Balakot, not just in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. In fact, the target was in Pakistan itself. It was located, was the large camp in hilly terrain, which was densely forested, an area where there wasn't a large population around. Um, the launch point itself of the weapons from the Mirage 2000s was just a few kilometers across the line of control. In other words, the Mirages made a shallow incursion across the line of control, and because of the range of the weapons themselves, they launched the weapons and came back to safety on our side of the line of control. What was the weapon? It was an Israeli weapon called the Spice 2000. It's a 1,000 kilogram bomb, six of which were actually used. Now, this is a smart weapon. It glided for nearly 100 kilometers. It was given pre-fed images, which it compared with what it quote-unquote actually saw as it came down onto the target. And then there were six explosions within this Jesh base itself. All six strikes were 100% successful, is what our sources are telling us. So six targets within this terror training complex were completely destroyed. The area itself was obliterated. Now, the initial blast, uh, blast analysis, this is sourced to the Home Ministry, is that 300 Jesh-e-Mohammed uh, terrorists, including a uh, terrorist who was involved 
in the hijack of the Indian Airlines flight IC814. Uh, they have all been eliminated. How did Pakistan respond? Well, Pakistan did respond by deploying its F-16 fighter aircraft, but by then it was too late. The Indian Air Force Mirages had just gone across. They launched, they returned. By the time the PAF got its act together, it was all over. Just uh, very brief comments there from uh, Donald Trump standing alongside the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un as they pose for the cameras. Uh, just being asked there, have you walked back on denuclearization, to which he gave the briefest of responses. That was uh, the word no. So the two uh, chatting via the translators and smiling at one another.